Hello from the Forstronics YouTube channel and welcome to how to build a lithium ion and USB power design with built-in charging and this will be part three in a four part series. Before I get started, I'll just mention if you like what you see here, please hit the thumbs up on the video and if you haven't already, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you're looking for help on a commercial project, either design, manufacturing, or just general consulting, check out Forstronics.com. All right, let's get started. Okay, here's the diagram for our design. You should already be familiar with this. In part two, we went into great detail on the voltage regulator design, the boost regulator. In part three, we're gonna focus on the battery charging circuit first, and then the power source isolation or switching circuit second. The power source isolation circuit's gonna be mainly like discrete components. It's gonna be pretty fairly simple. The battery charging though, is not something I wanna handle myself in software or hardware, so I'm gonna use a battery charging IC. So much like in part two, we're gonna go through the, the IC, we're gonna use data sheet and then look at the schematic on how we implemented it and how we came up with our supporting components. In part two, I went over my process for choosing ICs and approaching a circuit that I need to design. I'm not gonna cover that again here in part three. We're just gonna jump right into the battery charging circuit. Okay, for the battery charging circuit, we're gonna use a IC from Maxim. We're gonna use the Max 1898. And this is a well-known IC for charging single cell lithium ion or lithium polymer batteries. It's been on the market for a while. It's easy to use. To power it, we only need between 4.5 volts and 12 volts. We're gonna use the five volts from the USB to power this chip. And of course, when we power this chip, that's what we're gonna to use to charge the battery, right? The power supply for this chip. It can measure its own current, which is needed. It can monitor and measure the voltage of the battery, which is needed. It also has an LED charge status indicator. The LED can also be used for triggering or blinking if there's a fault condition. There's two main model numbers you should be aware of for the MAX 1898. One is ends with 42, and that just means that it will charge your lithium ion battery up to 4.2 volts. The other one is 41, which means it'll charge it up to 4.1 volts. In my design, I'm using the 41, but if you use the 42, it's the same setup and the same components that I'm gonna cover here in this video. Okay, here we have a typical implementation of the circuit. So we have the IC here. If you look at the input power, this is where it's gonna come. The input power is used for the LED, but of course it's also gonna be used to power the chip and also to charge the battery. And if you notice, you have a P-channel MOSFET here. So you can either use a P-channel MOSFET or a PNP transistor, but basically this IC is gonna use it like a variable resistor to control the current flow to charge the battery, which is over here. You have a shot key diode just so when the battery's not charging, it's isolated from the charging circuit, so that's why the diode's there. And you know, CS pin is gonna be used to supply the charge power, but the DRV pin controlling the gate is gonna be used to control the MOSFET and use it like a variable resistor. And then of course this bat pin is gonna be able to monitor the voltage at the battery. So we need to monitor the current flowing to the battery as well as the voltage to do a correct safe charge. We have an enable pin. We have this CT pin, which is a safety timer pin for charging the battery, which I'll talk about more. And the other nice feature is we have this I set pin where we're gonna choose a resistor value that sets the fast charging current for our battery. So we can control what current we use to charge our battery. And like I said, lithium ion batteries can be charged fast, but typically the faster you charge them, the lower cycle count you get out of them. So what's nice about this chip is you have control over that charge rate. Now, just like in part two, I'm gonna mention that I read this whole data sheet and I always encourage you to do the same if you're using an IC, but I'm only gonna cover certain parts in the data sheet for the video. Here's a block diagram of the IC. So if you remember the, the diagram we just showed, here is the input voltage or the power supply. We have the LED and you can see they basically have a current source with a MOSFET that they can use to turn on and off the LED. We have our input for the power. And so the idea here is you have some real low ohm resistors, right? 84 milli ohms, 20 milli ohms. And so this gets fed directly to the source of the MOSFET. Here's the MOSFET here. And then we have it flow through here, but we also have it flow over here 
And we have a bunch of op amps in this circuit. I'm not going to pretend to know how everything in this circuit works, but we can put some of the puzzle pieces together. But you can see we have some current flow down here to that I set resistor. So based on the value that we choose for that I set, we'll get a certain voltage drop here. That's read back by these op amps. And you can see this op amp right here is directly linked to driving the gate of this MOSFET, which it uses as a variable resistor. So by monitoring the voltage drop here, knowing what this, um, well, setting this resistor, it basically leads to the direct control of this PNP transistor or MOSFET. And you can see we have the Schottky diode here and the battery for charging. Otherwise, we have the enable pin. We have this restart pin, which I'll talk about later. Just like I showed for the voltage converter or voltage regulator, we have this applications information section in the data sheet. So this is really gonna tell us what components we need, how to calculate different component values. They have a diagram with a transistor as well as a MOSFET. We're gonna use a MOSFET in our design and we'll go over this, these equations and the components when we go to the schematic. But the last thing I wanted to show you is this block diagram. So this block diagram, or I should say state flow, is kind of shows how the IC works. So if we're here and our battery is below 2.5 volts, remember we, we have our regulator set to cut off at 2.5 volts, but even with the regulator cut off, there'll still be a tiny bit of current flow. So if our circuit's sitting there for a while, not being used and the battery's connected, the battery could fall below 2.5 volts. So what the IC does is it, if it is below 2.5 volts, it does this pre-qualification charge, a slow charge to get it up to 2.5 volts. Now, if our timeout expires, and I'll talk about the timeout later, during this pre-qualification phase, there's a fault the, uh, and the battery charger will shut off and it'll blink the LED. I've not seen that happen yet. Once we get to above 2.5 volts, we go into the fast charge or normal charge state. So this will start charging the battery at the current that's set by that resistor that we're gonna calculate. And then eventually, as the battery becomes almost fully charged, it goes into a lower current charge state and does sort of a top off. And then basically what happens is, is once we're done, charge is complete, the charger will turn off and the LED will charge up, turn off. They also have this last state up here that if for whatever reason the power supply is below 4.5 volts, or the battery voltage is higher than the power supply, it'll be in this shutdown safety mode and won't do anything. So that's how the IC works. It handles the charging for us. It also has some safety features so we don't blow up or overheat the battery. Okay, let's take a look at the schematic. Okay, here's our MAX 1898 IC. And so we have this C17 capacitor here that links the drive circuit to the input voltage and i just chose 100 nanofarads why because that's what the data sheet said it didn't really give me a functionality for this it just gave you directions on how to implement it this vdd bus if you remember the vcc bus is feeds the input of the voltage regulator vdd is actually at the input of the usb that's isolated from vcc which i'll i'll show later but the idea here is VDD is only applied when the USB is connected. Therefore, the charger is only powered up when USB is connected. Here's the LED that's controlled when we're charging. It turns on and then turns off when we're done charging. If there's a fault state, it'll blink. Speaking of fault states, CT basically is a timeout. So if the charger is running too long, you can set this capacitor and it, after a certain amount of time, if the charger's still running over that whole time period, it'll shut off as a safety measure. Now I'm choosing C13 to be 100 nanofarads, which basically defines around a three hour timeout. If you wanna use a different timeout, they have a formula here for calculating it. And if you're familiar with capacitor equations, you can see this 34.33 number is related to the you know RC time con constant of a capacitor. So it's using sort of an RC time constant as a timeout. R3 is our R set pin or resistor, I should say, and this is what's gonna control the charge current. So the way we calculate this, and once again, I get this from the data sheet, is R set equals 1400 divided by what you want the charge current to be. So if you remember the example 
lithium ion battery that I showed in part one, it had a amp hour rating of 270 milliamps. So I'm using a charge rate of 1C or 270 milliamps. So when I plug this into the equation, I get a resistance value of about 5185 ohms. Well, that's not a common resistor value. So what I did is I approximated it to 5.1 kilo ohms, which is a common resistor value, and that's what I'm plugging in for R3. The other thing, though, you can do with this iSet node right here is you can also use an ADC from, let's say, a microcontroller to monitor the charging if you want to. I, I don't do it in my setup, but the idea here is you can use this uh, equation down here, V charge, which should give you a voltage of about 1.4 volts. If you measure 1.4 volts here, it means that you're in fast charge mode and you're charging at the set charge rate. For us, it's 270 milliamps. Once the battery is almost charged, fully charged, the current will quickly start to drop down. And so this voltage will drop as well and it'll be a linear relationship with the current if you just wanna monitor the charging. Next, I'll mention this restart pin, which is pin six, and I tie it to ground. So basically, if you tie this restart pin to ground, it means that whenever your fully charged voltage is, one point, excuse me, 4.1 volts or 4.2 volts, whenever that voltage gets below 200 millivolts of the max setting, it'll, it'll kick off the charger, assuming the charger is either enabled or getting power. If you want to change that, there's a equation in the data sheet, I don't have it here, to set that to a different value. But once again, by tying it to ground, you just set it to 200 millivolts minus the max charge voltage. The other thing the data sheet provides guidance on is choosing the P-channel MOSFET you're going to use as a variable resistor to feed current to your battery. So for Q17, I'll, sh I'll share the bomb in part four, but here's some of the specs on the MOSFET I chose. They, they recommend some and they also recommend certain specs. So this has plenty of voltage uh, leeway for, for how we're gonna be using it. It has a one amp max current, which is plenty for us. And it has a max drain to source resistance of 200 milli ohms, which the data sheet recommends not going higher than that. And you want that to be low because you're going to get some power dissipated across that if it's too high. I chose D1. They just recommend getting a Schottky diode. So I chose D1 with a low voltage drop, and that's what a Schottky diode is. The diode has a maximum current of 500 milliamps. So even though the charge, the charge I see can do higher than 500 milliamps because I'm using this diode, I can't go higher than 500 milliamps, but I'm safe because I'm using 270 milliamps. And then of course the battery connects to here. So this green node is where the battery connects. I have a connector for the battery, but that's on a different schematic, but it basically connects to this node. C16, this is another capacitor where the data sheet says just put a 10 ohm capacitor here. And my guess is it's just to hold that, that, battery, that battery voltage steady for the IC, which is gonna monitor that battery voltage using the BAT pin. So I talked about the CS pin is gonna supply the current. The drive pin is going to uh, control the MOSFET. I talked about the restart pin. The voltage in pin is where the power is going to go. This charge not pin controls the LED. The enable pin I'm not going to use because the way I enable this chip is only when the USB power is connected. So I just leave the enable pin floating, which is what the data sheet said to do if you're not using it. The ISET pin I already discussed and the CT pin I already discussed. So that's our battery charging circuit implementation. Next, I wanted to go over some of the requirements for the power isolation or power switching circuit because some of you might be wondering, well, what exactly does that do or what does it need to do? We only want one source, one, one of our power sources being fed to the input of the voltage regulator at a time. The main one is USB. So whenever USB is connected, we want that to power the regulator. And so whenever I plug in USB, we want the battery to be automatically isolated from the input of the regulator. And when I disconnect USB, we want the battery to be routed to the input of the regulator. And we want this to happen seamlessly, right? And we also want it to happen fast enough that our regulator, the output of the regulator, the voltage doesn't drop because it has too little input voltage. 
because that will cause our load, if we're using a microcontroller, to possibly reset, which we don't want. So we want that, that switch over between our power sources to be seamless and we want it to be fast. And then lastly, and I, I hinted to, towards this when I was talking about the battery charger, is we only want the battery charger to get power from the USB, meaning we want it isolated from the input voltage voltage bus of the regulator. So that's something to keep in mind is we only want the charger to be enabled or powered from the USB connector. So with that in mind, let's look at the circuits for our isolation. Okay, here we're looking at a schematic for our USB connector. So this is a USB type C connector and you can use USB in your design or you can just have a general five volt input. I'm not gonna go into the implementation of this connector. I have a video on USB-C, uh, powering a design with USB-C and the USB connector, how to, how to implement it, USB-C. But the idea is this is where the input voltage bus comes from USB, the five volts. I have some capacitors and a ferrite bead to, to help clean out any noise from that signal. But notice we have our VDD bus and we, are, we have our VCC bus. Right? The VDD bus is what's going to power the charger. The VCC bus is what connects to the input of the regulator. So the way we isolate those two is we have a shot key diode once again. And the idea is this diode has a very low voltage drop. And so when USB is removed though, it blocks the battery power from getting to the VDD bus. So the charger circuit will not be energized. And even if this diode drops about, I don't know, 200 millivolts, so that we have lower than five volts here, it doesn't matter because our boost regulator will boost that back up to five volts. And then here we're back at the battery charging schematic because we also have our switch to switch between the input power sources to the input of the regulator. So remember, VCC is the bus to the input of the regulator. Here's where our battery is. I have this jumper in here just when I was uh, when I first designed this circuit so I could play around by isolating the battery if I needed to, but I just put this in for debug purposes. And Q5 is a P-channel MOSFET. In fact, I use the same model one that I use for Q17. The way this works is the gate, the, the source is tied to the bus of the regulator, the input of the regulator. The drain is tied to the battery. And then the gate is tied to VDD and also has a pull down resistor. So the idea is when VDD is applied, the gate is more positive than the drain or the source, or at least equal to the, the source. So this is off, which isolates, you know, off when I say off, it acts like a switch and opens and isolates the battery from the VCC bus. But if I remove VDD, which is unplugging the USB connector, the gate is pulled to ground and the battery voltage turns on the P-channel MOSFET and allows the battery voltage to flow to the input of the regulator to provide our five volt regulated bus. So that's how our charging circuit and our power source isolation circuits work. That's it for part three of how to build a lithium ion and USB power design with built-in charging. I got some great questions and comments for the first parts one and two, so please keep them coming for part three, and feel free to comment if you think I missed anything. And then in part four, we'll look at the PCB layout with a focus on the voltage regulator. We'll look at some testing of the design and we'll share the bomb. Thank you for watching.